All right. Well, I want to officially welcome everyone for this evening. And we're talking about the city of champions. That is Detroit, of course. Um, my name is Samantha Lurie. I am an adult services librarian for the North Hill District Library. And tonight we have two wonderful authors of this book. They are both um, University of Michigan professors. Uh, let's see if I can get these names right. Zilka Maria Zynek and Stefan Andrew Szymanski. Um, great. <laughs> so they will talk to us about their book while they are talking. Um, you can put in questions that you have for them in the chat box and I will make sure they get answered at the end of everything. But if not, um, we do have a small enough group tonight, I believe that when we get to the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. They have a wealth of knowledge and they'd be happy to answer your questions. So I'm gonna pass it over to Stefan. Thank you, Samantha. And uh, thank you everybody for coming along this, uh, this beautiful spring evening and spending time with us to talk about our book. Um, it's really a pleasure to be uh, able to talk to you about it. So uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give a brief introduction on the sort of the, the story behind our writing the book. And then Zilka is going to read a passage from it and then, then we can open it up for questions. So um, the first thing probably to say is, as you may guess already, is that we are two foreigners writing about Detroit. And um, it, 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 we both came here from, from Europe, Silka from Germany, myself from the UK, and we came to, to live and work in Ann Arbor, but we both fell in love with Detroit, the city. Um, and there's something compelling and beautiful about the city. And the more you visit it, the more you spend time in it, the more you discover and the more, the more there is to know and understand. Um, and so we wrote this, we wanted to write this because, because of our deep affection for, that we feel for the city um, as outsiders. Um, and perhaps that's a little bit to do with the sense that Detroit always has this sense of a little bit of being an outsider in the United States, uh, this border town, um, it, it, which, but it's that is also so central to American history, which makes it so fascinating. And we would argue the most important uh, city of the 20th century as a whole, more important than New York, more important than Los Angeles, more important than London or Paris or Berlin. Detroit really made the 20th century through the motor car. It was the iconic city. People came from all over the world to witness this modern marvel. And that, um, that whole arc of the city's history played out throughout the entire century, both on the way up and on the way down. And that's important, I think, uh, we think in terms of understanding and thinking about the city. Now, we chose to tell the story through sports and that has its own history to, um, uh, in our own backgrounds. But I, I think one thing we'd like to emphasize is the way in which uh, sports is a natural vehicle for telling history of cities, um, particularly where in the modern era where uh, historians have recognized that culture plays such a central role in understanding the past, and sports in the 20th century became, in some sense, the central uh, cultural institution of cities. It, some ways, sometimes the main way in which people still identify with the city is through its sports. So in, that, in some ways, it's natural to tell uh, uh, the story of a city through its sports. And although some people like to argue that sports is something that we should put on a pedestal, it's an ideal for us, we tend to think of it rather differently. We think of sport as being the perfect mirror. It shows exactly who we are. And that could be very good and that can be very bad. But it, it, in, it, when tracing the story of sports, you can see uh, things that were going on. Uh, you can see the undercurrents within the city and understand them better in, in our view. The other thing to say about the way we wrote this book, which, um, Frankly, when we've spoken with historians, it's caused them a little bit of anguish, is that we tell the story backwards. We go backwards in history rather than uh, telling a linear history from starting from uh, Antoine de la Motte Cadillac and working forwards. And we did that deliberately. Um, 
So for, and I think there are a number of reasons we can say that. Firstly, the, one of the problems with telling history as a, as a straight line um, from the past to the present is it gives you some sense of inevitability that somehow all this was preordained and destined to happen, which it wasn't. Nothing was preordained. It all happened. Uh, things could have been different. And when you go backwards, sometimes you can stop and think about the events and not really think about it as being part of a natural logical progression, uh, an inevitable progression. Um, it also means that each story really is, is foregrounded in its own right. It's not part of, it's not following on from the previous chapter. It's not somehow uh, a, a, an inevitable, a, a necessary link. It's something that happened in its own right that was important to the people who lived in that time and should be understood in through the eyes as best we can of the people who lived in that time. And the other thing is, in some ways, you could say it's a bit like uh, the way an archaeologist would approach uh, a, a site or a city. You start from the top and you dig down and you don't start, you don't go to the bottom and, and work your way up. So in that sense, it has a natural progression. And if that sounds a bit too highfalutin, then maybe a, a, a more a, a, a better way to say it would be to say, it's also how when you get to learn about a city, it's often how things start. You arrive in a city and you see it's present, and it's only over time as you come to know a city better, do you get to understand its past and you get to see the things that happened. And so we felt that it was uh, uh, in some ways a natural way to, to, to look through the history of the city. So that's our, uh, well, that's our justification, that's our excuses, and we're, we're, we're welcome, we're willing to be challenged on, on that, but it, it, it gives you something of our perspective that we took in writing the city. And now um, Zilka is going to read you uh, a section on what she believes I think is the most important part of the book. <laughs> I want to mention um, be, before I do that, so the book comes in, in 30 chapters where we try to find representative big deal events in the sports history of Detroit. So if you have the book, it's also great bedtime reading, right? You can just read a 10, 10, 15 page story at night, right? You don't have to commit to a huge, big, long history, right? You can dip in and out, right? You can, oh, there's something from the 18th century. Wow, or I'm more interested in the 1920s, right? So you can just hop around um, and it will still all make sense. Um, so yes, yeah, so while I wrote this, I became kind of obsessed with Joe Lewis. Uh, who I'm convinced is the greatest American athlete of all time. And I will fight you on this. Um, he was a much more complex character than he's given credit for. And I think his history is uh, much richer than many people know. I will just read a brief excerpt, but I'll be happy to talk to you for seven more hours about Joe Lewis if you have any questions about this. So this now starts during the war when Joe Lewis volunteered um, for the cavalry, he was actually, for instance, people don't know this, he was a very fine horseman and he had a horse farm outside of Detroit where many people went to, to ride horses and he was very proud of that. Um, so he volunteered um, for World War II and he wasn't sent to fight, he was too valuable as generally the most globally most famous American at the time, right? He was, well, certainly the most famous athlete, but possibly the most famous American in the 1940s. And so I'll we'll start reading. Joe Lewis deep ties to Detroit. Now the industrial center of the war effort made him an even more effective spokesman for the war. In some ways, the most significant contribution he made was financial, promoting government bonds that were funding the military. To that end, he gave speeches, made radio appearances, starred in government-sponsored films about his life, produced in Hollywood and designed to persuade Black America that this war was their war as well, never mind segregation um, or Jim Crow in the armed forces. The army organized national and international tours for him as well, where he would display his boxing skills to army base audiences. They were very popular and he'd often buy steak dinners for the entire base at great expense. He's a very generous man. He loved to spend money. These tours also gave him the opportunity to express his own views on segregation, which he did frequently. At one such gathering in Detroit, he proclaimed that 
if blacks were given an even break in the army, we would show the world how to win the war. He openly criticized the policy of not admitting educated African-American soldiers into the officer class, most notably in the case of Jackie Robinson, the baseball player with whom he hung out at, at one army base. And the army actually changed the policy and did, um, did admit several African-Americans to officer training. In part, it is believed because of Joe Lewis' advocacy. Eventually, he refused to engage in exhibition fights on segregated army bases. And on one famous occasion at Camp Seibert in Alabama, decades before it was a Bark's famous protest, he sat down in a bus station labeled white only, refused to move to the black section and got himself arrested. Did he allow himself to be co-opted by a war machine that could not have cared less for the civil rights of African-Americans? Perhaps, but he did say his piece quietly and often not so quietly held to his convictions and he became a hero to much of America in the process. It's often said that Joe Lewis was the first black man to be a hero to all of America. It's true that World War II did mark a turning point in American race relations and the seeds of the later civil rights movement were planted in the 1940s. Some of them by men like Joe Lewis who had to walk the tightrope of respectability. But that did not mean that a man like Lewis would be allowed to excel beyond the confines of the ring. In 1948, Lewis, $500,000 in debt to the IRS, and that included taxes he owed on money he had donated, but he had often donated all of his winnings, pretty big purses, to the Navy. Uh, he wanted to, in 48, he wanted to acquire a Ford car dealership in Chicago, selling the same cars he had helped build as a boy in the 1930s when he worked briefly at the River Rouge factory. Henry Ford II himself, who had taken over from, from old Henry Ford, asked for feedback from his dealers and regional managers, and 35 pages of that correspondence are preserved. They are a dismaying read. District Manager Johnston reports that, quote, we feel quite certain that we would lose all of the state of South Carolina's business, which would involve over 400 units a year in normal times and that many present good Ford owners would never buy another Ford product. Houston weighs in, believes Ford Motor Company would be boycotted in the South. Indianapolis worries that whispering campaign might be started by competition. Pennsylvania is bluntly told that this would be construed as supporting Harry Truman and the other left-wing groups in an election year that would definitely give us bad public reaction as they don't give a damn for Harry Truman. Some of the letters seem touched by a smidgen of bad conscience. For instance, Dearborn's district manager says no, but writes, if on the other hand, other factors should be given consideration, such as human relations, constitutional rights, or some such factors, then we would probably have to change our decision. Others don't even try. Alabama's Mr. Lloyd strongly recommended that regardless of any circumstances that we do not appoint Joe Lewis or any other Negro as a Ford dealer anywhere in the United States and that we keep the Ford business a white man's business. New Orleans, Ford business is a white man's business. We do not want any Negroes in it. Frankly, if we had a Negro in the organization and it so happened that the writer was thrown into contact with the individual at a conference meeting or presentation of Ford products, he would not attend. So whether it was because Ford would lose business in the South or because appointing a single black dealership in Chicago would signal Ford's alliance with communists and left wings, or because respectable white dealers from the South would refuse to attend conferences or because the competition would exploit it, or because Ford would be seen to side with Truman and the civil rights legislation that was beginning its long march through Congress. One thing was clear, Ford would employ African-Americans and use them for PR purposes but it certainly would not allow them to become employers in turn. If the first black American hero was going to find the money to pay his taxes, he had to return to the ring. He lost his last fight in 1951. So much for what happens to very famous and highly revered sports figures when they try to move beyond the confines of where they're allowed to excel. Right? It's kind of very tightly defined spaces. We uh, found that over and over again, right? Um, and also goes to what Stefan said earlier, right? That sports exposes 
society in its best and in its worst aspects, right? It's really a mirror of where the country is at any given moment. Okay, are we moving to question questions? Sure. <laughs> I, I would love to. I would love to hear what you're all thinking, what's on your mind. And... Yeah, if anybody has questions, um, we're a small enough group, I believe you can just unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, that. Well, I got a question for both of you. You said the book, I, I have not read the book yet, but you said there's 30 chapters. So what's your favorite chapter? Mine is Joe Lewis. I'll just, was closely <laughs> follow, followed by Malice at the Palace, which I think is also a completely fascinating story to tell. I think I, I have a, a strong sentimental attachment for the last chapter on chapter 30, which is about um, what I think is the oldest sporting, recorded sporting event in Michigan. Didn't actually take place in Detroit, but we included it. It's the famous um, lacrosse game played at Fort Mackinac mm. uh, in 1763. Uh, which uh, was used as a subterfuge to uh, capture the fort from the British. And um, it enabled us to, to talk a little bit about Native American history in Michigan as well, which I think is, a, is an important subject and something that one should, should talk about. But I think, uh, um, so, so I, had, I have a, a, an affection for that, for that particular chapter. Well, that's really interesting because when you think of a book about Detroit, and in sports, you, you wouldn't think of the Native American aspect of it. But right. the fact that you included, you know, that that event, that, that's pretty cool. There's a wonderful book, if you're interested in Detroit and the Native community, there's a wonderful book by our former colleague, she left Michigan, Tyam Miles, called The Dawn of Detroit, um, which is, uh, it's a heartbreaking book, but it's really, really wonderful, highly recommend it. But no sports. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat, for that question. Anyone else? I can um, relay off of Pat's question. Uh, so my, my original question was, how did you book end this book? The first story and the last story. I know that Stefan just mentioned the, the last story of, of this book with the lacrosse. Um, why did you bookend that book? Um, tell us about the first story and then why why did you have the first story and why did you have the last story? Well, I mean, we, we start off the book by talking about um, District, District Detroit and the Little Caesars Arena. Um, which in some ways is, is, is sort of, um, again, it's a, like uh, this whole idea of, of sport being a mirror, it's both a good and a bad story from, from, from the, in some ways it's a very, a very good thing, the way in which it cements in to the, to the heart of the downtown, these now three major sports centers, Ford Field, Comerica Park, and Little Caesars Arena, which makes it a, 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 a makes the downtown a very compact location, which can bring in visitors, which can be um, very successful commercially um, into the future. And so, in some ways, that's a great story, and particularly bringing the Pistons back to the downtown uh, where they had, you know, after they left um, so many years ago, um, under under something of a and, and under somewhat controversial circumstances. Um, so that's a good side of it. I mean, and unfortunately, the sad side of this story is the way in which um, the, the promises um, made to redevelop the downtown were not kept. And, and some of the questions about whether the, uh, the city funding was really potentially raiding funds for uh, Detroit schools, and that's, that's obviously not a good thing. And so um, we thought that this was a, it was a great way to, to, to bring this to, I mean, again, I, if, if I had to say, uh, as, as someone who spends a lot of time writing and thinking about sports and uh, art, 
it's not questions that are sports good for us. Um, I would say there's a question mark there and, you know, there's good things and bad things. And I think this, this, this final story illustrates that, that um, or the first story, um, the final one in, 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 in time, but the first uh, story in the book illustrates this ambiguity that is always surrounding the meaning of, of, of sports in our, in our modern world. The, the last chapter is actually set in the future. It's, it's an epilogue. And so one, one theme that Stefan is also particularly knowledgeable about. So Detroit applied to host the Summer Olympics over and over and over again, nine times, I believe. Um, some less serious event um, attempts, but some very serious, very good bits, right? Um, and Detroit had every reason to expect that they would win one of those bids to host the Summer Olympics. And every time they thought, now it's our turn, something happened. And once again, Detroit was, uh, was passed over. Um, so our epilogue envisions a future Summer Olympics in Detroit um, and how that, what that might look like. And we also have taken the opportunity to reinvent the Olympics a bit. Um, not as this kind of monster event where huge stadiums are built and um, deface the city the Olympics come to never to be used again, but, but as an actual community event that is good for the city, that involves Windsor, right, that becomes a border Olympics. Um, because as you probably know, cities are no longer particularly interested in hosting the Olympics, you kind of have to twist their arms because um, all the big promises about economic development and business and so on, they have not really played out. Um, so right now, most cities are no thanks, we'll pass. And so if the Olympics themselves could be reimagined, they could very well take place in Detroit, which has a lot of the infrastructure in place, particularly if you take it together with Windsor, you could have rowing competitions around Belle Isle, right? Or you could have the horse equestrian, the equestrian games on Belle Isle. You can have racing along um, Jefferson Avenue and so on. So um, that is our, our contribution to the future of sports in Detroit. Um, and because it would also, you know, as you all know, right? If you're from the area, Detroit in the national imagination has this, this horrible reputation, right? Oh, it's all crime. When I first came to an office, like, oh, don't go to Detroit, it's too dangerous, right? You'll get killed, blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, you know, that that's, that's just not true. Um, but in the national discourse, Detroit still holds this place as a ruin of a city, as a story of decline, as a story of poverty and ruins. And um, I think imagining a summer Olympics in Detroit would bring out an entirely different story and structure of Detroit um, that could um, uh, finally get the national love we believe the city deserves. We're a bit rah-rah for the city, as you can tell. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I also don't have the book yet, um, but I, knowing the two of you, I imagine that the Detroit Football Club plays a role in the book. And uh, I'm curious how you fit that in. What, what aspect of Detroit the soccer scene mirrors? <laughs> Stefan, I'll let you as a... Well, so I, I, it's, it, it, it's a great question. Um, so one of the things is that obviously Detroit historically is this is this great soccer city. And, and again, that's something that people often don't know, but you can find plenty of examples of soccer being played in the city going back to uh, the 19th century. Um, you can see leagues that uh, have arisen here and you can see repeated attempts um, to, 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 to create a soccer infrastructure. And it somehow it never quite took, but the, the efforts over and over again um, took place. And part of this is to do with the car industry and the way in which Detroit had such close links historically with the European car industry via Ford in or General Motors in Britain, in Germany, uh, especially. And that always meant that there were plenty of people coming from those countries wanting to try and bring in a soccer culture and, and, and make it part of the 
uh, make it part of the city. So, I mean, it, the, the number of different leagues that have been created in Detroit is, is quite remarkable and the number of different attempts. But um, to talk about Detroit City FC, I think is, is um, obviously it, it's something slightly different from, the, from the, uh, what we've seen um, historically and something quite slightly different from American, the traditional American culture around teams. And the people who created Detroit City FC, um, they're Americans, but they have, they, they base the, some of their ideas on things they've seen in England and Germany are, around building community uh, soccer. And so what they're trying to do is they're not trying to build up, they're not trying to become a major league soccer team. They're not trying to be a big razzmatazz commercial entity. They're trying to build up a, a, a social uh, environment for, 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 especially for young people in Detroit to, to, to build, um, the, you know, uh, communication networks and try to develop, um, de develop that aspect. And then that community side is something, you know, we wanted to talk about in the book and, and, um, and stress how, again, when sport can have a really positive impact, it can have this relationship with the community. And I mean, there are, in Detroit, I mean, even although Detroit City FC is a wonderful example, there are lots of other examples of, of community soccer going on in, in, um, uh, in Detroit. So in Mexican town, there is this huge field where there's regular, uh, all summer, there's regular games going on that involve not just um, people of um, Mexican descent, Hispanic, but also uh, some of the uh, people of Arab descent, the, those communities are joining in and creating this very vibrant cultural interchange. So there's, there's um, soccer is quite a, a big deal in Detroit, one way or another, in terms of its connection to, to the city's um, culture. Was that the, the answer you had in mind, Johannes, or were you also after some? I had no answer in mind. That's great. That's uh, it's very interesting. I, I know very little about it. I think the European connection is extremely interesting and I hadn't thought about it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's They've been criticized a bit for having a fairly white fan base. Um, and it's, of course, also true that certain sp sports seem to be in themselves a bit segregated, right, when it comes to a fan base. Um, and it's kind of hard to know how that will develop. I know it's on their mind. Um, we'll see what happens there. They started women's league, they started youth leagues. Um, they, um, they have pretty strong progressive leanings. There's always rainbow flags um, along with um excuse me fuck mls flags um and so um there are also some kind of gesamtkunst rack these games there's um they're really really fun to go to so even if you don't give a damn about soccer you will have a very good time at a dcfc game um there's slow's barbecue there's margaritas and other cocktails there are people dressed in quilts and various other costumes um there are sometimes so they have uh, maintained close ties to the the polish part of him tramic so sometimes you have um polish heritage shows at the as the halftime shows um it's it's quite it's quite wonderful and uh I've, i'm very interested in him tramic and this kind of interesting little enclave inside of Detroit and how that functions. Um, so yeah. Monique, there's a question in the chat. There are so many famous athletes and teams associated with Detroit, Joe Lewis, Cody Howe, Steve Eiserman, Barry Sanders, and the list goes on. What athlete or team in your opinion captures the champion and which the defeat when it comes to a city of triumph and defeat. Uh, that's a very nice, I will give my answer um, and it will come as no surprise to you by now that it is Joe Lewis of, on both counts. Um, Joe Lewis, I think was, as I said earlier, one of the, maybe the greatest American athletes of all time. He was a civil rights icon, which is largely forgotten 
He was also very actively engaged himself in civil rights, which has barely been covered. He has this image of being the compliant, respectable athlete, right, who was acceptable to everybody. And I think that needs to be rewritten and I'm on it. Um, but after, um, after he lost his last fight in 1951 to, to Rocky Marciano, um, life went a bit downhill. Um, he had substance abuse issues, um, which either led to or were combined with mental health problems. Um, in, in the end, he was still, he had still many, many friends. Wherever Joe Lewis went, he had people want to buy him a drink and shake his hand, right? He, he was, uh, he remained famous uh, for the rest of his life. But in the end, he uh, ended up as a greeter in a Las Vegas casino, which I mean, for all we know, he might have enjoyed tremendously, but it does seem to be a, a slightly, a bit of a, of a downturn, right? Um, and what always moved me and enraged me a bit about this is you probably know about the biggest fight in Joe Lewis' career was the 1938 fight against Mark Schmeling, who was um, the Nazis' biggest boxing star. And this fight was kind of sold as a throwdown between democracy and fascism, even though we now probably say it was a throwdown between two different versions of white supremacy. Um, but Joe Lewis's victory in that fight, which took him two minutes and four seconds, so it was pretty damn decisive, but it made him a superstar. Um, and it was a huge uh, black eye, literally and figuratively, for the regime in Germany, right? They, they did mind. Um, so what happens to Max Schmeling after the war? So while Joe Lewis loses all his money, why the IRS hounds him, and in the end he kind of he stands in the casino and says, "Hi, how are you doing?" to people who come to gamble. Max Schmeling does not just do well; he does do well as the owner of a Coca-Cola franchise in Germany. He gets the Hamburg distribution, the Northern German distribution. So while Joe Lewis is not allowed to sell Fords, a completely iconic product. The Nazi boxer gets the Coca-Cola, the even more iconic American product, makes a goddamn fortune of it, right? And, and lives till, I think he died at age 90 something. Did extremely well. Honored, rich. He and Joe Lewis are said to have reconciled. They are said to have become friends. I am not sure that isn't a bit of a, of a concoction, a kind of reconciliation fantasy. Um, there's a, a long interview Joe Lewis gave, a kind of autobiographical story he told to Life magazine in the late 40s. He said Schmeling was the only boxer he fought he ever hated. He said every, everybody else, he almost felt sorry about hitting them. He, he was not sorry to hit Max Schmeling. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about that. Oh, and then they became friends story, maybe. I'm still looking for actual evidence for that. So that is both the triumph and the defeat in, in one person, I think. Stefan. Yeah, so I, I, I think I would pick another boxer actually to think <laughs> about this. And we have a chapter on Tommy Hearns and his career in the, in the 1980s. And there were, there were a number, there were sort of four middleweight boxers in the 1980s who really revived boxing in many ways and made a, made it a sort of a, a, a you know a global spectacle again and Tommy Hearns was from Detroit one of the one of those four uh, but he mostly lost he he did win a few fights against the I mean he he was a great boxer in his own right but he was he was usually on the losing end of some of what some people consider some of the greatest fights in history um, and I mean, he, I think he's a great symbol because of, firstly, I mean, he was from the Kronk Gym, the famous Kronk Gym, and um, the Emmanuel Stewart created this amazing stable of, of boxers coming out of Detroit in the, in the 19, from the late 1970s onwards um, at this Kronk Gym, which was uh, uh, this very, um, very low key establishment that was um, became in some ways the center of world boxing for 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 a decade or so it was uh, every it was it was absolutely world famous and, and really essential and 
So, and it, it um, Tommy Hearns was was a was a major part of that. And although he lost many uh, uh, many of these big fights, he also brought in huge amounts of money that kept the 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 cronk going. And and part of the tragedy is really that what that um, when Emmanuel Stewart died, the the cronk Jim died as well. And um, and it, it most tragically of all, it was actually demolished uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, it was really one of these locations that ought to have been preserved as a symbol of, of you know, uh, of, of the city. And it has its own history. And in fact, it, it, we talk about the, the earlier history of, I mean, the, the name Kronk is a, is a strange name and people often don't know where that comes from. It's actually a name of the Polish councilman in the 1920s whose uh, son uh, was tragically run over in a car accident, a very early car accident in Detroit. And as a result of that, he lobbied to create uh, a recreational facilities that would, would be a safe place for children to play. And that was actually, that's actually the origin of the Kronk Gym. It was named after him after it was built. And so again, part of this weaves into this story of the city, both the, 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 the tragic and the triumphant and I think, um, you know, so and I think so I think Tommy Hearns uh, symbolized that. Of course, Tommy Hearns is still, you know, again, like many boxers, fell on hard, has fallen on hard times, but he's still a great hero in the city. And I think, uh, you know, a much beloved figure um, still today. Don't be shy. I'll ask another one. Um, while researching, what was your most surprising discovery? Oh, well, I I can I can go first while Zilka thinks about that. So, um, so for, for me, I mean, and, and in some ways, for me, the origin of being interested in this is actually the discovery of the Detroit Olympic Committee archive um, in Detroit Public Library. Um, so uh, I actually read. Uh, I, I, so I've been in. I've been here for ten years now. Um, and soon after coming here, I, I, I. One thing I did. I, I subscribed to Michigan history when I came to um, D Detroit uh, to to Ann Arbor, thinking I ought to learn something about the history of the area. And I came across this article that was about the. Um, the attempt that uh, uh, Detroit made to win the 1968 Olympics. And it was a story of that, the failed bid and um, a very well written article actually. And so I, I was fascinated by that. And this article mentioned that there was an archive in Detroit Public Library of this Detroit Olympic Committee. So being typical academic, I thought, okay, I better go look at the archive. And I trotted along to Detroit Public Library and said, can I look at this? And then I discovered there's this 30 boxes of materials in this archive going back to 1938. And that document in immense detail that uh, over and over again, the attempts to bring the, 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 the Olympic Games to the city. And the, Again, it, you know, the times they came close, the times they were, the times they were, you know, were, were passed over, and the things that they did to try and bring it, what their plans were, how they, where the Olympic Stadium was going to be, and all, and all of these things. And um, uh, I, I've been mining this archive for my research uh, in a number of areas uh, ever, ever since. And one of the most, um, one of the most poignant. Uh, a part of that archive is again from the 1963 bid. Um, it has in it a the, in, for the for the bid for the 68 games. They organised a petition, um, and um, they uh, through the newspapers uh, to get to drum up support for the Olymp for, for the Olympics. And these petitions, you'd sign these petitions and send them in. You'd organise. You'd get signatures from you know 20 or 30 signatures on a page. Um, and all of those petitions are in the archive. There's a whole huge fat box of all of these. And uh, 
I've since digitized these. Uh, I've got them all written, uh, all the names transcribed, all the addresses, and I've actually been working with some researchers to draw maps to show where people were who were supporting the bid for, this, for the 68 games. So um, that's been one of the most interesting, I think, and, and surprising. I, I mean, I had no idea that Detroit was such a, had a, strong, a strong Olympic tradition. And I think most people don't really realize that, but it really was uh, a, an Olympic city. And perhaps one of the great travesties, travesties of Detroit's history is that it never got the chance to host the games, which um, in my view, it, it so richly deserved. I'll just say something. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about Joe Lewis, even though that's probably the right answer for me, but uh, <laughs> sorry. But I think one of the things that was the most fun of just a small thing, was to visit one of the roller derby leagues. It's not just because roller derby is a lot of fun and it's pretty big in Detroit, right? Um, even though a lot of um, a lot of teams come in the suburbs, some are city based. But what I found the most amazing is that the, the the league placed in the old Masonic temple. So you come into this grand, grand building, marble, three story height lobby, right? Very much from from this, this the kind of grandeur years. And then you take the elevator up to the third floor and go through some huge big door, right? Also very grand. And then there's the roller derby ring and you enter a completely different world. And I find these kind of juxtapositions in Detroit just so unbelievably lovely, right? You just never know what you find behind a corner or through a door or what's in these buildings you often cannot tell. And these kind of little surprises have meant a lot to me. And I'm sure we have missed so much. The last time we uh, we had an event at the, at the Dearborn Public Library, which was very lovely. And people asked us about a particular Detroit game, right? And we felt very bad about having missed it. It's a, some kind of bowling variant, but played with wooden blocks. One of you know what we're talking about. It's still apparently played somewhere in Hamtramck. Is it foaling? Possibly. With an F? Could be. It's something with wooden blocks that get. Yeah, I believe that's, that's, oh, feather bowling. Feather bowling, maybe. It could be. Could be. It sounded like great fun and I felt, I felt very negligent for having missed that and for not having a chapter on it. For the sequel. <laughs> chapter 32 yes i also another thing i feel detroit and i don't know if if someone would correct me on that i'd actually be very happy but my sense is that detroit is a very masculinist city very male dominated i don't know whether it's related to the industry um which was kind of male coded even though women played a huge part particularly during the war but we don't have a lot of don't have a lot of material about women in the book. And I kind of felt bad for that. Um, and if we ever did a second edition, that is something I would like to, to correct, if possible, if it made sense, right? I mean, we're looking at iconic events and the only really iconic event was um, the Nancy Kerrigan um, mm outside of Joe Lewis Arena, and we felt that really shouldn't be the only chapter about women's sports should not be one of uh, kneecapping a rival, particularly because it was just happened to be in Detroit, but it wasn't Detroit athletes really involved, so. You might be talking about feather bowling at the Caju Cafe. Could be. Yes, yes. That sounds I about right. That, that cafe that was mentioned, I think, yeah. Oh, okay, so. Stefan, there's a question in the chat for you. What's the reason Detroit never won the Olympic bid? So, um, so the, the answer, there are several different answers, but they, they fall into two categories, really. So, so one is, I mean, effectively, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the chair of the US Olympic Committee in the 1940s and 50s was a guy called Avery Brundage, who went on to become a president of the International Olympic Committee. And he was actually born in Detroit, uh, but he grew up in Chicago. And um, he seems to have had it in for the city. 
So he strung the city along for many years saying, well, if you only wait, keep bidding and next time you'll get it. But then he did, he seemed to do everything in his power to stop Detroit from winning, from winning the games. And he, he in many ways was, was a, a fundamental obstacle. And he was very close to um, the Southern California uh, Olympic Committee who were absolutely dedicated to making sure Detroit never got the games and, and in many ways, in many cases, actually sabotage bids that Detroit made. So that's, so that's one reason. That's the sort of the external reason. Then the, but there is, a, there is an internal reason, which is Detroit ought never built uh, an Olympic stadium. And um, it made many plans. And, and there were, there are, there are, we have lots of uh, architectural drawings of plans for an Olympic stadium and lots of discussion about building it on the fairgrounds, building it on the riverfront, building it in Midtown, but it never happened. And if they had actually committed to building an Olympic stadium, that might have actually um, put them over the top and actually got it. So I think that's the, that's the sort of internal, the domestic reason as to why they never got it. Um, there were there, there's a question were there special facilities built to enhance Olympic bid? Well, not really. There is the Mathai Center in, um, in, in, in part of the uh, complex of um, the uh, Wayne State, which, uh, which was Fred Mathai was actually the guy who was behind all of these bits. So there's one guy really from the 1930s, right up until 1960, 1963, this guy, Fred Mathai, who was a Detroit businessman who, who committed himself to doing this. Um, and the Mathai building was, was part of that. But again, part of, the, part of the thing was that Detroit didn't need to, per, to, to engage in much purpose-built uh, um, uh, investment because it had an awful lot of sports facilities already. If you go back in, in, in time, the, the, you had the Olympia Stadium, you had uh, the fairgrounds, which would have been provided um, uh, 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 facilities. You had uh, the old Tiger Stadium. Uh, you had the Detroit uh, Stadium, Detroit, where Detroit, um, University of Detroit played. So you had quite a lot of the facilities already available. So they, they never needed much. The one thing that would have swung it would have been uh, an, Olympic, uh, an Olympic stadium. And, and, and that's the thing that never happened. You had Brennan Pools. Yes, which uh, Brennan Pools, which staged um, the uh, US uh, Olympic swimming trials on a number of occasions. Uh, that, absolutely. And uh, 56 and 60. Yeah, yeah, very good. And um, uh, they, I mean, they, they've been recently renovated, the Brennan Pools, it seems, and, I, and I've never seen them being used, but it's a, it's a beautiful location, and it would be nice to see that, that revived. Um, there was even talk of putting the, the Olympic Stadium in that, in that area, actually, at one point in the 50s. Pat has a great question about the cover. Um, one of our greatest embarrassments is that the, um, they flip Pi Cobb. Um, so they make the, um, right. <laughs> uh, we, we did not choose. I, I made sure Joan Lewis is on the cover. That, that I take full credit for. But the other images were chosen by the creative team. Um, also the colors we went on. And we, were, we liked it well enough. Uh, that was okay. kind of cute, and um, and and I mean Ford shows up a lot in the book. Um, it is so deeply. It was involved. nice and clean. Mm. Did Mama brush your hair? <laughs> Did you? How handsome! Okay. I I did notice that Ty Cobb was uh, flipped. But uh, Ty, Ty Cobb was a left-handed batter. Yes. And, uh, but but I, I thought, oh, that's just whoever, you know, manufacturing issue. 
we are <laughs> very we embarrassed. Were quite embarrassed to, to see it, but then it was kind of too late and we should have paid attention earlier and didn't. And so it goes. I think somebody left us a, a, a very unfriendly Amazon review. Based but at the next printing, <laughs> people can collect the first edition and, and it'll be worth something. I like the way you think, Pat. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the paperback edition can have a, a different cover. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Do you guys like the cover otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like I like it too. Um, if if we could have Ty Cobb flip back to who he <laughs> was. Ty Cobb comes up a lot. I mean, he's another one of these towering athletic figures, so also kind of very ambivalent, right? They're, I mean, he's obviously a great athlete, and there's a lot of controversy. Was he a racist? Was he not a racist? How much of a racist was he? Um, has it been overblown? Has it been underreported? And so we, we write a little bit about this controversy. Um, in the end, we don't know. Um, but uh, one thing I found um, talking about what was surprising and interesting about writing the book. Um, so when we first started writing it, we went a lot to the um, Detroit Free Press Archive, New York Times, Washington Post, right? Um, and as time passed on, more and more newspaper archives became available. And then a lot of black newspaper archives became available. And you found often a completely different story, right? In the African-American papers than you found in the mainstream papers. I found that fascinating and, and um, worth pursuing, right? So, um, how many how many different takes there were on the same same event? And of course, Malice in the Palace is a is a more recent uh, event that a lot of you might remember, um, uh, and that also that was so heavily politicized. Rush Limbaugh talked about as oh there you have it Detroit is the new Fallujah right. Um, and it was in some ways it was so weird because it became a quintessential story about Detroit, even though it actually wasn't in Detroit. And the people who started the fight were an Indiana team, right? But somehow it then got sold as, oh, there you have it, Detroit again, right? Those thugs. And it was uh, it was fun to to go through the archives on on that story. Um, oh God, it's almost eight. I have another question. Um, when was Detroit seen as like the the shiniest gem mm. in world athletics? Like, what time would you say that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, the the the, the year of nineteen thirty six, where when the city is declared the city of champions, that's obviously. Um, you know when the 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 Tigers had won their world, first World Series, the um, the the Red Wings had won their first uh, Stanley Cup, and the um, the Lions had won their first NFL championship. So that was clearly a, a major moment, probably you know the the one that is most commemorated um, when Champions Day was created by designated by the. Uh, governor of Michigan to to remember the the city success. Um, so I think probably never. Ne and, and of course, uh, you know, in some ways, um, I mean, what's interesting about that is that 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 was that in that was done. That whole city of champions idea was was raised as a as a way of trying to. Um, uh, 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 make people feel better about the city, make people feel better about the, because it, we were in the middle of the Great Depression. And so it was a sort of a morale boosting um, uh, affair. And of course, I mean, the interesting, I mean, some ways the interesting, some ways the, the if you think about where, where the roots of Detroit's problems lie, in, in many ways, you could argue that it was the failure in the 1920s, in the in the glory era of the car industry, not to use that great wealth to to beautify the city. Um, uh, um, Fred Mathai actually once joked to one of his presentations, probably not a joke he should have made, but he once joked, you know, people say Detroit is a great place to work, but not a great place to live. That's um, 
and people did say that. And so in, in some ways, if there could have been a continuity created between the 20, in the 20s with the, with the wealth and to create the, the, the sporting infrastructure, the recreational infrastructure that would have gone with a city as, as grand as Detroit, that might have helped sustain its, its athletic preeminence. Um, but I think in some ways, you know, although there were, there were high moments, there were high points after 1936, I mean, I think in some ways Detroit has, has you know, struggled to recover that kind of athletic preeminence that, that it had. I mean, there have been great athletes and great teams since then, but never all at once in the way that they were in 1936. Were there any more questions from the audience? I suppose one question um, would be like, well, you've mentioned a lot of different reoccurring themes throughout the years and your different stories, um, but what, which ones would you say would be like the biggest reoccurring themes that you would find in these different stories? I think for for me, for someone who actually doesn't like sports very much and was one of the most unlikely people to have written a book about sports was just the way sports is connected to every facet of a city's life. Um, I think that that is kind of the one continuing theme for us, right? How it reaches into the car industry, how it reaches into city planning, how it reaches into a city self-understanding, right? It's celebration of itself. It's one of the most difficult, but also most important chapters to write. We anchor in the 1968 Tigers World Series win on the heels of the uprising in 1967, right? which for many people is seen as a turning point in Detroit's reputation, even though we know now from historians work that um, the city started emptying out in white flight, but not only white flight started in the forties, right? Um, not as sometimes common assumption has it after the uprising. And um, so both the, the, the promise and the limits of sports was, was something I think that, that we kept coming back to, right? Because there's some people say, oh, the World Series healed a city after its hardest moment. And it's like, no, it was a great night, right? People danced on the streets. Um, there were fireworks. There was, it was a fantastic night, little mayhem, but actually relatively little. Um, but a sports event cannot heal the deepest, darkest troubles a city has, right? But it can give you this moment of togetherness, right? Where a city feels this is our city tonight, right? We celebrate as a city that um, I think can be overrated, but it can also be underrated. Um, I think these, these moments are just deeply meaningful, right? Deeply meaningful celebrations of a city as qua city because sports teams, as Stefan said earlier, it's kind of the only way now cities present themselves as a city, right? It's no longer through the symphony orchestras, they've kind of become specialty affairs or the theaters, right? But sports are still meaningful to just vast amounts of, I mean, everybody knows where the Tigers play, right? Um, as you can ask Americans, I think you get a majority hit on who are the Tigers. People tell you the Tigers are in Detroit. What what else does that for a city, right, at this point? So I think, uh, yeah. I think one, what, so thinking about this, I mean, one event that, that sticks in my mind from the story is, I think it's the opening season of uh, the Detroit creams who would become the Detroit Tigers mm -hmm. in I think 1894 if I'm remembering correctly and the opening pitch is thrown out uh, to a guy called Charlie Bennett who had been the catcher for the Wolverines Detroit Wolverines when they won the World Series in 1887 I think it was or 1883 and the 
thrower of the opening pitch was Hazen Pingree, the mayor of Detroit, and one of uh, one of our great heroes, uh, one of the great uh, figures in Detroit's history. And um, if you don't know about much about Hazen Pingree, you, you easily forgiven. He's not not much is people have forgotten a lot about him. Although you still his statue is still there on Woodward Avenue. He's one of the two statues um, uh, just on on the um, uh, at, at just outside Comerica Park. And uh, he was a great uh, progressive social figure. Who did a lot to try and make did a lot to improve the life of the city, and particularly to help people during some of the great uh, economic crises of the of that of the that decade, that last decade of the nineteenth century, um, and just just the way in which you know that's just an an everyday event, throwing out the opening pitch of the season. Um, and and yet, you know, it's tied up with the politics and the history of the season. And so it, it in some ways, it, it you know, it doesn't matter that it was a sports event. It doesn't matter what it was for. It's just that, you know, it's the sport is the lifeblood of the city. And, you know, everything that goes on is you can see mediated through the world of sports. And it's not the only thing. There's music. There's other forms of culture as well. But the sports are always there in the background. And that's the thing that I think. Um, for, for us, at least in terms of writing the book, made the book work is the fact that it was always possible to find these, these themes in the history of the city that ran through their sports. I want to mention that there's a very fine bourbon by Valentine Distillery called Mayor Pingree. <laughs> I highly recommend it. It's, it's a very, very nice drink. Well, I want to thank both of you very, very much. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I think that this was a wonderful discussion. I have to say um, all the stories that you shared with us were just wonderful. Um, this is their book, of course, City of Champions. This is the library copy. I would promise to return it and <laughs> let other people read it. <laughs> so if you if you want to, and like Zoka said, I'm sure it's, you know, you can pick it up and put it down, nice little vignettes of, stories that you can enjoy and not have to read it all at once. But um, this was a great discussion. Thank you for taking your time and sharing all your thoughts. Um, this was wonderful. I hope everybody else has a great night and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank it was a coming, lot everybody. of fun. Really enjoyed thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Enjoy the one and nice weather tonight. Yes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>